Hi, hi, Julia. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself, Des? Uh, I'm not bad. Julia, your frate. Mm-hmm. I afraidy for the Americans that can't pronounce Italian names. <laughs> so, uh, w- welcome to the podcast. I mean, it's not really fair that I've 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 forced you to do this, but I. <laughs> I know you from from Instagram, and yes. uh, I've I've known you for quite a while on Instagram. But I was surprised to see that you had been, I guess, recruited into the into the front line of fighting COVID nineteen. Correct. Yeah, it's been a very interesting uh, last thirty days. So, so your your normal job is what? So I am a sports medicine physician at um, NYP Columbia. And so normally I do interventional orthopedics and like I'm a big proceduralist. I do a lot of microinvasive surgical procedures for chronic tendon injuries and take care of a lot of dancers. So oh, you're, a sur- you're a surgeon also. Uh, so I'm a proceduralist. So I don't do like ACL repairs or like the or knee replacements. I do um, minimally invasive procedures where you use ultrasound to guide where you're going. Oh, cool. So I'm a I'm an in between surgeon and regular physician. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're based up there in what is that like up in 168th Street? Yeah, exactly. So I'm my main office is actually in Midtown at 51st Street by um, Radio City Music Hall. Right. But um, right now I'm up at 168th all the time. Okay. So what happened? So COVID nineteen strikes and. Uh, all, all hands on deck. Like, how do you get the call to say, I know you're normally worried about people's tendons, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're, un- we're understaffed and we need you in the ER. Right. So the first thing that happened was um, our department. Uh, so my whole department um, was told we're canceling all elective surgeries. You're canceling all elective procedures. You're not allowed to see people in clinic unless it's an emergency um, starting today. Um, and so that was on a Monday and that was, uh, March 16th, I think it was. And, um, initially nobody was recruited to anywhere else. It was just try to do telehealth, figure out how to do telehealth, take care of your patients like that. And anybody who had like an emerge, like if there was a fracture, I would have come into the office for those people type thing. Okay. Um, and then about, um, the Canadian came out. Uh, and then about uh, a week later, part of my team got recruited to work for Workforce Health and Safety. So those are the um, uh, physicians that take care of the people of NYP. So we were getting sick. Our workers, our hospital workers were getting sick, taking care of these COVID patients, especially in the ED. And so somebody had to be taking care of them and be helping get them out of, um, you know, out of their work environment, telling them what to do about staying home and then re-recruiting somebody else into their position. And so uh, around that time, so that was about a week later, um, they asked, they sent out an email, you know, um, throughout the entire hospital system and said, is there anyone who'd like to volunteer to go to the front lines and help out in either the emergency room or um, in the ICU? um, So so when when, when they when they say volunteer, are they saying for free or are they saying are you willing to work um so it's quasi for free so as an nyp physician um we get paid a salary anyways but we make we make bonuses off of our productivity so now my productivity itself has has gone down to basically nothing besides the telehealth visits i'm doing so so you're kind of working for free to some extent or you're volunteering to work but you you're you know, you're still getting your normal base salary. It's just it's only your base salary. But it wasn't mandatory. So this actually was like a, a an altruistic act by you. You could have just sat yeah. this one out. Yeah. So it's it's not that it. Um, so everybody was redeployed somewhere. It's just did you go to the safer redeployments versus right. the not as safe? So did you? Yeah. Did you did you uh, do the National Guard or did you go to Vietnam? You you went, I went to, to Vietnam. Nam. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Nam. Yeah. Um, I I. I do a lot of global health missions. And so I've been in environments where, you know, there's, um, you know, it's not COVID, but it's something bad is actively happening. And I've kind of had to MacGyver my way through things because sometimes even if I'm not the best physician to do something, I'm the only physician there. And so that kind of mentality is what kind of pushed me into volunteering. So, okay, so, every- so, so, so oh, sorry, I was just going to say, take me into like day one of walking into the ER. So had you worked in the ER before, by the way? 
So as a resident, yes, and as a fellow. So during my sports medicine fellowship, um, I did um, some time in the ER because when you're a team physician, you're covering on-field emergencies. So if somebody had, you know, a spinal cord injury on the field, heaven forbid, or somebody had a concussion or whatever, you have to be able to manage fractures on the field, stuff like that. So I had been in the ED uh, back in my fellowship, but I finished my fellowship two and a half years ago. So I've been at Columbia now for two and a half years. So I was rusty. Um, so you walk in day one and was it like, was it an immediate like, oh shit, or actually it was March 16th or 17th or 18th or whatever. And it wasn't so crazy yet. Um, so I, we had to, anybody who doesn't normally work in the emergency room or in the ICU or the critical care unit, um, which is where all our ventilated patients are. Um, we had to be kind of re-educated on some things. Like I haven't managed a ventilator since I was an intern, which was now seven years ago. So that's been a while. Um, and so we had to be retrained. So we were doing some online training and figuring out scheduling because you don't want to have too many people there because initially we didn't have that much PPE. So if yes. you had too many practitioners there, then you didn't have enough gowns and masks and gloves for everyone, which would be problematic down the road. Um, and so we were trying to stagger who was going. Um, and then they ended up making a schedule so that those of us that were what we're calling off service. So I'm not normally an ICU doctor, but now I'm working in the ER in a makeshift ICU. So I was working with an actual ICU doctor so that if I had questions, because I haven't managed these things in a long time, I had somebody to kind of turn to but he had backup help so yeah um, so you still you definitely were useful you weren't like getting in the way right i mean they needed no i mean i hope not i <laughs> definitely wasn't trying to get in the way um no like they kind of said like what are your skill set like what can you do and i'm a good proceduralist and i'm really good with an ultrasound machine so i can use ultrasound to start like central lines or um arterial lines so i actually went through our emergency department and anybody that was intubated, I started all the central lines on them or all the arterial lines on them so that we could get blood gases so we could be checking labs because then it shortens the amount of time the nurses are spending with each patient in terms of drawing blood and stuff like that to try to send lab work because when somebody's yeah, so it's a, a it's a division of labor right so it's less exactly. people less time of exposure because the more you're exposed the more time the more chance you get it right Isn't exactly that? the viral load goes up and so right. that's why those of us in the hospital are at higher risk than somebody like you just in a crowd because the viral load for us is so high because everyone in there is sick it's not like one or two people that you walk yes. by are sick yeah and you know you know for sure like you're definitely you're, you're there putting in this yeah so are you? Yeah. So actually, first let me ask you this. So how did it feel in those early weeks where you're in the New York City, one of the wealthiest cities on the planet, and you're dealing with a PPE shortage? Yeah, it was really weird. I was I was angry at first, I think. Um, and and my hospital did a really good job of getting PPE for us. So um, you know, kudos to NYP for that because that was a huge deal for us. Um, but it was very nerve wracking. It was. Um, it's, it's a really weird problem or like, I don't know, moral dilemma within because you as a physician, as a nurse, as a anybody who works in a hospital is always like, I want to take care of patients. Like that is what I do that I put my life to take care of people. But you're also not a martyr, right? Like I didn't, I didn't sign up to be a martyr. I'm not trying to get myself killed at 32, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so it's more about um, how can I how can I keep myself safe and still take care of these people really well? And so always in the back of your head, there's this concept, don't touch your face, don't do this, don't do that, don't cough, don't sneeze, don't, you know, don't get too close, don't forget to put this on. But if somebody's coding, meaning like their, mm. their heart stopped and you want to go do compressions and start do, um, running a code, you have to gown up first before you're allowed to go in there to start saving somebody's life. And that is so backwards from what, we've often thought of but truly when we learn how to do cpr and how to do you know um rapid response the first thing we're supposed to do is make sure the environment's safe and so it's just it's not a volcano or a hurricane it's uh it's a you know invisible assailant the invisible enemy as trump says yeah because yeah, really my cousin uh, my cousin is a nurse and what is it well cornell or cornell well well. Wild Cornell, yep. Yeah, yeah, Wild yeah, Cornell. Wild Cornell. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she had it, and now she's back at work after having yeah. it. So now she does all the CPRs because she's got the... 
antibodies. She's got the antibodies. Yeah, she's a, yeah. a superwoman. She's got exactly. special, she's superwoman special powers. Now. Yeah. So so what was it like then? At, at, so you've been there now, like at this the peak, I guess it's supposedly sort yeah, of chilling out now. Yeah, the peak was like but, yesterday, I think. Or two yeah, so ago. what 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 was the what was the feeling like a war zone? That's the word that seems to get bandied about. Yeah, war zone, but but a really interesting one because um, initially when people were coming in, they're all coming into the emergency room sick, but now half of the emergency room has turned into an ICU. So it's just a bunch of people on ventilators, which is creepy to some extent um, because it's so much quieter in a weird way Right. until somebody has something actively go terribly, terribly wrong. And these people get stuck on uh, ventilators for a really long time. And so we're finding that like there's these highs and lows of like super busy and then everything's just kind of stable and you're just waiting for the you know for the shoe to drop you're just waiting for something bad to happen um and then other portions of the ed are still filtering those fractures those heart attacks those um strokes that you know inevitably are still going to happen people are yeah, still alive how, how much of that's going on because i assume car accidents and stuff like that are way, way down, down because nobody's way down, on the yeah. road but yeah. like like in terms of like strokes and heart attacks and stuff like is that is it a normal amount of stuff that's coming in? I think we're seeing it a little bit less, but I the issue is I'm not sure if that's because people are so scared to come to the hospital now that they're dealing with it at home, which is not great, but mm. perhaps. Um, uh, and and the other question is, you know, we have the Javits Center and we have um, the USS Comfort, so mm. we have these other two areas where people might be getting streamlined that would normally be coming to us, but instead are getting streamlined over there. Um, we do still have a couple of our operating rooms open for emergency procedures like that, but part of our ORs have even turned into hospital beds now. Is that right? So That's how like, many people we have. So can I ask, what is the moment where you need uh, to go on a, is, is an intubation basically going on the ventilator? Is it the same yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, what are the things that make you go, this is the moment where we no longer have any choice but to intubate yeah so basically what happens as far as we know with covid is you get basically this really bad inflammation of your alveoli your alveoli are the lowest part of your lungs they sit down in the bases of your lungs basically and so if you can't get good air exchange down at your alveoli because of all this inflammation happening within your system you that's that's usually when somebody needs breathing help so we're checking um, something called spo2 so you're Pulse ox, your yes, pulse yes. Oxygenation. So I know about all that with my my good. CPOD mother. Right. Good. Perfect. Um, so, um, if somebody's pulse oxygenation goes down kind of below that ninety two, maybe ninety, um, that's when we're kind of heavily considering putting them um, on a ventilator. And the really ninety two, ninety, Jesus, like ninety ish, yeah. And but the the, <laughs> the issue is this. So if you want to put them, we'll try putting them on like a nasal cannula first, see if that mm. brings them up. If that doesn't, then sometimes we have to put them on a, what's called a non-rebreather, which is like that big mask thing that mm. people have on. Um, but the problem with those and like BiPAP machines is they aerosolize particles. So when those people are breathing, all of this air is getting blown back at their faces and coming out the sides of those masks. And so all COVID. the... COVID that's in there is getting aerosolized all around them. So now if I were to go into that room, there's a good chance that I would get that. Um, and so it's, it's not our reason for not trying that, but we just have to be super cautious. And so if somebody's like kind of tanking and we're like, uh, they're, this is going to happen faster than we want it to, we kind of bypass that middle step now and we're saying okay it's probably safer to intubate them obviously because then you just you right. have control so, over the so situation. So you guys you guys are not intubating on like a code You're, it's well in advance. We're, of that. we're trying to yeah because right. the codes are the worst situations like mm. that would be where it'd be dangerous for us and dangerous potentially for them as well. Now, just um, coincidentally enough I just happened to read that they're they're trying to intubate people less I heard by like Shifting, did you see this thing about shifting them around? Proning them. Yeah, yep. proning. So prone people. My yeah. new word. So that's flipping onto your stomach is prone. Um, and so we've actually been having pretty good results with that. And so anybody that we can prone, so some people get really nauseous and they can't tolerate it. Um, but if we can prone them, a lot of our physical therapists right now are helping out with that. That's part of like their new redeployment is they've been helping to prone people. Um, to help flip them kind of onto their side or onto their stomach to see if we can improve the air uh, flow into their alveoli. And is that proning um, working better than like 
traditional people that desat? Like, is that working better? Be- like, does COVID problems seem to respond well to proning, or is that just yeah. something that works in general? So, not necessarily in general, but with acute uh, respiratory diseases, sometimes it can be helpful. Um, and so we're finding that it is here and we're even doing it for people that are on the ventilator. So even if they have been vented, we might still try to prone them even on a ventilator just to really improve that airflow. Because the, the issue that we're seeing is once somebody goes on a ventilator, it takes a really long time to get them off if they ever get off. Um, I think Governor Cuomo mentioned something like 80% of people that go on ventilators don't come off of them which is a staggering number. I mean, that's really, really high. Yeah, um, I mean, it's I'm, so it's so high that you would almost feel like, what's the point of intubating? Right, and so it, it's, it's, it's simply for that chance that we can get some of these people better. There's certainly people that are coming in, and because this happens so quickly, there's people that are coming into the hospital that, you know, don't really have a will, don't really have good, um, you know, power of attorneys laid out. They don't really have their wishes known. And so we have to presume their full code until we can get a hold of a family member or until they can tell us what they want. And so that's also been an issue is there's some people that we're unfortunately having to intubate where we're like, there's no way there's, they're going to make it through this. There's no way. They had too many comorbidities already. And now we add this to the mix and then we're stuck putting this person on a ventilator and managing them until we can find their family, which is really hard. That's what my, that's what my cousin said, that that's the toughest thing is that you, you don't know anything about these people and you're, yeah. you're, you're probably giving no chance of having any interaction between the family and they, it's a lonely scenario. It's very lonely. And, and that's the other thing with the ED. Usually the ED is very, is like just busting at the seams with people in it. But now, everyone's coming in by themselves. They can't come in with a loved one. They can't, somebody can't be sitting in the room with them. And so in a way it's a ghost town and in a way it's very, very busy. It's just extremely strange. Everyone's in masks and you know, you see everyone in their gowns and their masks. Uh, some of my residents are in the ED at the same time as me. Um, so I'm you know, still trying to teach my residents at the same time as I'm trying to learn from you know, one of the other attending physicians. So it's, it's a strange and feeling. Have you had any, I've, I've, I mean, there's some, t- terribly sad heartwarming story like have you had any of these scenarios with the face timing or the different things that people crying out names and stuff i mean you don't have to share yeah it's too yeah it's 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 hard to watch it's hard to be part of um i i honestly give a shout out to our palliative care team because they are doing a lot of this work they're calling families they're they're the ones doing the facetime with the patients if we think that they might not make it um it's it's beyond emotional and I, I can't even imagine having to do that job sometimes um, because they're just like, I don't know enough about this person. We just mess th- met this person yesterday. We haven't had, you know, we don't know their hopes and dreams and what they wanted. We don't know their families. And then they're trying to talk to their family and figure out what would this loved one of yours actually want. Um, and so that's been really hard. And we did, um, we did also lose one of our medical students, which was, um, I think I mentioned that to you a couple days ago or something, but we lost a medical student, which was really, really hard too, because, you know, we keep hearing, oh, if you're young and healthy, you'll be fine. Well, in most cases, yeah, maybe, but again, our viral load is so high. And so this person had this great, bright future ahead of them and that's it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so tragic. I mean, I, like I, 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 I can assume since it's a once in a century occurrence that you could have never imagined that you would be in the in the middle of this, where most of the time you're dealing with people's tendons and it's called like life improving, you yes. know, like yeah. life improving scenarios. I'm sure yeah. you deal with some more serious stuff, but yeah. to, to then suddenly move into this life and death, just like you're surrounded by the palliative care team dealing with these like death scenarios that that's yeah. that's a big switch to make it is it is and it's it really it makes you remember why you became a doctor to some extent because you're like there's not a lot of people that would say oh yeah i'll go to the front line let, let me be that person i'd love to i'd love to do that with my life today um but it also it just kind of reminds you how precious life is and how how lucky and blessed we are to have the skills that we can even perform any of these duties um but it's hard and it hurts and there are you know I've I've completely self-quarantined myself from anyone so I don't my friends can't come anywhere near me like 
they're like, oh, let's go for a jog near each other, and I won't let them because I'm like, I'm probably just teeming with COVID right now. <laughs> so um, my my super intendant, the people that live in my building, they all know that I'm a doctor, and so they're not allowed to go on the roof when I'm on the roof. Like it's oh really? It's really it's very depressing, to be honest. And and you know I don't have kids, but those colleagues of mine that have children that they're just like, I don't let my kid touch me anymore. Like that is just blows my mind and it's 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 painful it's hard and then how do you feel with the uh the the videos and i'm sure you've seen it the thank yous when you walk out and stuff like that oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah those are so, so even like i i videotaped somebody out my window yesterday like uh, just a ton of people clapping too and it's on the 7 p.m's yeah the 7 p.m's it warms my heart it really did um and having people say thank you because we've you know and this is just part of life i guess but uh, i think a lot of times like in healthcare because people expect us to always be there they you know they're like oh healthcare is a right and so i, I don't think we really get set, told thank you very much um it's kind of like hurry up and fix me so i can go do stuff again uh and so sometimes it can actually be a thankless job and um people don't necessarily realize that so it, it feels nice i guess to be recognized and appreciated um but I, I think i'd say i dare say most people in healthcare agree with me that we're like we're not trying to be heroes we don't want to be called heroes i'm not thor or superwoman like i'm i'm just a person who's trying to do their job really really well and take care of people um but you just, just happen to have the you just happen to have the right skills at this yeah, time yeah you know yeah. which will which will go down as one of uh, main events in, in in history i mean it's the yeah. big it's the big event of this time you know exactly and, and, exactly and you know i mean there's a sadness to it too with the anonymity of all these deaths and like myself and my brother were talking the other day and we were saying like 9 11 every 9 11 they read out the names and i mean i know some of those names and it's very sad and it yeah. but it gives it gives a it gives a sense of meaning to these people's lives and yeah like now ten thousand people die in, in new york and there's an anonymity to it which is this is just That's as strange. big a historical event as 9 11 but yeah there's not the same sense of the victims the victims are just a big blob of numbers on a screen exactly and again i think it's because it was the invisible assailant in this situation so because we can't see somebody to blame mm. it's just like a thing whereas 9-11 osama bin covid yeah exactly osama bin covid i mean i lived in canada when 9-11 happened so i wasn't here for that and now i'm kind of recognizing how new york really truly does kind of just come together um in a situation like this so it's it's been nice to see it's been nice to see everybody really push you know hopefully I get my green card so i can stay here afterwards <laughs> you just, yes, all, do all, all this non, work and then all non-green card doctors should be give automatic green card i would think i would like one i mean i've lived in the states 12 years now i've been in new york two and a half and i'm still waiting for a green card and it's just like i hope this maybe convinces them that i'm worth keeping i don't know well i, I don't want to keep you much longer but i i, I just i want to ask because uh you know the, the 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 narrative for quite a while was that the, the 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 prep wasn't done like does it feel like things are, are are better now like even though people were late and obviously possibly the outbreak shouldn't have been as much as it was but in terms of you guys and ppe and ventilators do you feel like they did eventually catch up for for you guys i don't mean about yeah. testing and stuff like that i just mean for what you're dealing with I think I think we caught up. I think we um, now, weirdly enough, so we have enough masks now, which is great. Uh, we're still trying to, you know, use them as little as possible. Meaning, like you have an N95 mask on and you wear that one all day long if you can, and then just put surgical masks over top to keep it clean. Um, which normally the N95s are disposable as well. We're supposed to get rid of them after each time we use them. But now because they had all these companies switch to making all these masks for us. Now we ran out of gowns because it's the same product. Right. Uh, it's the same materials, I guess. And so now they're trying to switch to make more gowns. And so it's definitely been a little bit of like chasing our tail. Um, and could we have been a little bit more prepared? Yeah, probably. But, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah. Uh, but I think that in terms of that, that's our PPE has definitely gotten a lot better. And so I'm, you know, grateful for that. And then uh, we had an issue with testing. So we weren't testing employees. We were just saying, I think you're sick. So you should probably stay oh, home. Right. Yes. 
which that was that was a big deal too because now we have employees that again are going home to their loved ones saying I don't know if I'm sick I might be sick uh, there's nowhere else for me to go I'm supposed to stay home but you live here with me so you, you know maybe you're screwed who knows um, yeah, and that's just such a, a mental head screw because oh it's yeah you really don't know right exactly especially people you know that some people just don't get bad bad symptoms but they live with an immunocompromised loved one or something and so it's like that loved one is you know, potentially in a bad spot. So um, now that we're testing our employees more, I think that's going to be really helpful as well, especially, you know, as we're trying to get these antibodies, donate blood yes. um, to hopefully use. So, so we're, we're catching up, but yeah, it was, it was dark there for a little while, but I think we're, we're past the hump and we're kind of starting to, we're at the plateau at least. So I'm, I'm hoping we see an improvement. And I, I would love trying... to go back to my normal job soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I know yeah. you're trying to, uh, I know you're trying to get a green card and everything, but yeah. when you're sitting there on the front lines in the chaos of it all, and you see the president of the United States sort of diminishing the seriousness of it some days and then other days seems like he's taking it seriously. Uh, you don't have to throw anybody under the bus, but what was the feeling on, on the front lines about all that? Um, I think a lot of us just kind of shake our head and go, you know, he doesn't get it. Uh, it takes a very special person to want to work in healthcare, honestly. And if you don't understand that that type of, you know, giving type of spirit, you just can't comprehend. We're not doing this to be on TV. We're not doing, I, you know, I could find a hundred other ways to be on TV. I could play a doctor on TV. I shouldn't have gone to medical school if that was the case. Yeah, well, you sent so, me that article. I mean, so so yeah. he, he sort of insinuated that some of these doctors that were complaining about the shortage of PPE were, were doing it sort of like to get on TV or probably right. like a, a, a sort of a Trump bias. Exactly. And, and, and maybe, you know, I try, I honestly try not to watch the news anymore because I'm like, I'm living it. I don't need to see what other people have to say about it. Um, it's, I'm really trying to educate people. So even on my Instagram, which is normally like very sports heavy, sports medicine heavy, I'm trying to educate people on like, this is what COVID actually looks like. This is what it is. I'm not an infectious disease specialist, so I'm not like the best person to talk to about it. But I definitely know more than the average person. Um, and I can try to at least get you the right information so that you can be educated. But I think most of us are just like, we're, we're here to do our jobs and we're here to take care of people. And if he doesn't appreciate it, then, you know, that's, I guess his perspective, but I'm proud yeah. of us. And I think what we're doing is great. And I'll express all your frustrations for you. publicly. <laughs> <laughs> I've I heard you do it before. <laughs> And then I guess I finally I'll just say I guess you guys must have been happy in a way despite so much death in New York. My Iris friends are always like, "What's it like over there?" It must have been a good feeling to not have ended up in those scenarios of who lives and who dies, sort of oh, like yeah. the sort of blanket DNR DNIs. Like yeah. you didn't have to make as many of those decisions, right? No, no. Um, we luckily had enough ventilators too, so we have. Um, as of yesterday, I think we had 750 people on ventilators, which is a lot, just at our hospital, not, not. Oh, just York. at your just, hospital. Just, okay. just at my hospital. Yeah. And now today it was down to 732. So, you know, we got 18 people off of ventilators, which is great. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot, but honestly, this is the first time it's actually dropped since this is all started. So, are you saying that 18 people got off successfully or 18 mm -hmm. people are just no, no got off, got off successfully. Which I hope they great. all did a TikTok when they were getting out because uh, when these that people... That was so sweet, Mike. <laughs> Dude, oh. It kills me. They're guy. so cute. <laughs> They're so cute. I, I've never seen so many doctors dancing. I mean, I am a dance doctor. I dance all the time. And so it's... I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. But like... I. It's it's amazing to see how happy everyone is and how they all like really do come behind those patients and they're like you know you beat the odds way to go we're so yes, proud of yes, you yes 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 it's pretty it's pretty amazing well listen thank you so much I mean it was just I've been talking through my arse I've been talking through my <laughs> hole as we say in Ireland for weeks yeah. about this whole thing hmm. and I just thought it would be nice to get the perspective of somebody who's in the know but also because I know that so many of my Irish listeners are curious what it's like in New York. It was good to get a, uh, you know, a perspective of yeah, literally the yeah. front lines. Yeah. It's a, it's been interesting, but, um, it's been a really good learning experience, I think for a lot of us too. And, you know, hopefully this does not happen again in the entire time that I'm working for the rest of my life. Yes. Cause one's enough. 
for sure. How many years do you think it'll be before uh, the normal moaning? No, no, the, uh, normal the normal moaning of hospital. Yeah, that it, 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 I think humanity. You know, there's a, there's a certain period of time, and then you go back to the status quo. Yeah, you know? I think a solid year. That's <laughs> 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 all. I'm sorry, but I do. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Do you want to give your Instagram? I know you have, you have a you have a work Instagram. That's up to you. Oh, if you sure. Want. Yeah, if people have questions, I'm fine. Uh, it's Columbia Dance Medicine. So. C O L U M B I A, like Columbia University, not Columbia, yes. the country. Yes. And then uh, dance medicine, all one word. Uh, that's my my work IG, and so people can uh, follow me on there. And if they have questions, you know, I can't answer you right away. I guarantee, but I can I can get back to you within twenty four yeah, hours. It, it, usually, it, the problem is that it's guaranteed they're not going to be COVID questions. They're going to be like. My left knee, I just have a little bit of, you, you know. Yeah, the, the, I'll be like, be, make a telehealth visit. <laughs> I'm still doing physical, telehealth. Be, doing physical therapy is one of those, like you say you're a comedian and people want to tell you a joke. And yeah. you say you're a physical therapist and people tell you some ailment, some some physical pain uh, that yeah. they have in their body. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, yeah. So our phys I have physical therapists that are awesome and I always like, I'm like, oh, you have PT questions? I'm going to send you to my physical therapist. I'm like, <laughs> If you need if you need surgery, I got you. You know, uh, or if you need an injection or something, that's that's kind of my. Oh yeah, I would cup take an, I would take I would take an injection my left hip. But anyway, we'll talk about oh, that really? another time. Well, <laughs> I got you. Once this all goes away, I will fix you up. I promise. Well, okay. Well, thank you so much. You got it. No problem. It was good to talk. And now you can you can say goodbye here and goodbye on the podcast. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>